Hi, this is the Holistic Dog Parenting Show, helping you become your dog's best parent. This is Roman, and today's guest is Catherine Phoenix from the UK, explaining how to prevent separation anxiety and stress after we're going kind of back to normal-ish. Hi, Catherine. How Hello. are you doing? I'm fine, thank you, Roman. How are you? How are you feeling today? I'm feeling good today. <laughs> Any anxiety? <laughs> Just Any a little separation bit. Anxiety? <laughs> Not necessarily separation anxiety, but there's definitely anxiety there. So. I, I have social separation anxiety. I haven't seen my friends for a while. I haven't taken my mm. dogs to social places yet. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you from and what do you do? What's your passion? Okay, well, dogs are my passion. Um, I've got quite a few. Um, I've got 20 dogs. Most of them are rescues. Um, some of them came here for rehabilitation for various behaviours. Um, I'm a qualified lecturer, was a head of school at a local college. And then I sort of have always trained dogs from um, very young. My father used to get German Shepherds for the, he, was, he owned pubs. And then he moved to Rottweilers as the German Shepherd line was, was not well. So he moved that way and he would just give me the dog to train at about nine. Um, obviously, there was different ways of training back then. So we've I've evolved as a trainer. Obviously, that's a number of decades ago now. Um, and then um, my job changed in 2012, and I started studying really hard on this, um, which was um, fascinating. It was a new area to what my original career was in but a lot of what my, my transferable skills to this coaching and mentoring people. Um, and I've developed through uh, fostering for a few rescues, a lot of skills, I suppose, with different types of dogs and different dogs and their needs, as well as the owners. So that's where I've come to this point now. Um, I'm very fascinated with the human animal bond, um, how it's affected by not only the human's anxiety, but also their avoidance, <clears throat> secure relationships with dogs, um, positive reinforcement, how that impacts on the dog, um, and how you see a dog go from very scared, like some of them I've got at the moment because I'm watching them out the window, um, to being confident and then they can be adopted or they end up staying. <laughs> um, if they, they can work with me with um, dogs that need some good socialisation, um, skill. So that's basically me in a nutshell. Um, as far as that goes. So you've been you've been in dog business, kind of, sort of, since a child. Like fifty three years. I was fifty five yesterday. I don't mind saying because <laughs> no shame in it. Happy birthday! So, <laughs> yeah, thank you, um, and thank you for your message, by the way. Um, so from. I've got pictures of myself when I was probably one, 18 months old at my my nan and grandpa's um, home in the garden playing with Shep, one of the sheepdogs. And I was, I actually didn't know this, but my mom told me not so long ago that I was training Shep to fetch the dolly pegs. They were the old wooden pegs for hanging washing on the line. And I was throwing them in and then he was dropping them in my lap. So from about, say, two years of age, I was doing that. Um, and then it just, I went away from that, as you do. And then I've come back to it. And then I went away from it again. And then I came back to it. So it's a it's a very rewarding career. It's harder than some people think, I think. Um, you know, it, it's people think I'm just with dogs all day. But there's times where it can get, and in this situation with this pandemic, it can get very stressful on the human as well as the dog. If the dog's not used to the human being home all the time and the kids are at home and they're used to having their quieter time where they're chilling. So it can have an impact on that. And obviously, as we age, our relationship with dogs changes um, and the dogs that we select change, maybe. Um, mine have. Um, and it's, it was just sort of a natural move when I was ahead of school I used to have some of the staff's dogs for the holidays and it was just a natural move when I um, took voluntary redundancy from my head of school job to, to sort of move into this for some reason 
So that was eight years ago. So I built up a business, which has, this has had an impact. Um, and, you know, done my work sort of marching <laughs> and working and sort of building it up slowly through word of mouth. Um, and I've got a good sort of um, recognition with the veterinary care people in the area. So I think that's a credit to me, to me and my work and my work ethic. Good. So well, I always want to say, sorry. The, the reason why I wanted you to share with us today your experience is because you have all these years of experience with different breeds in different situations. You were a foster, you were a trainer, you were a child in the family, you have a family, you are in a, in a, in a community. Um, and, and England is going through a crisis, which to, to better understand for us in the US who are not aware of that, UK and Ireland have been through many crises of difficult conditions. Yeah. pandemics yeah so there, there is a fear imprint already on those people that if we see the word pandemic we are in a fear state your people died like whole generations died out and people moved away from the country kind of situations now how how do people respond to to the regulations that you guys have right now and what are the regulations and restrictions you have in your area well at the moment in the uk um <clears throat> We're allowed to go out to to shop, to get from the pharmacy our med, med, medicinal supplies, um, so food and the regular stuff that's in the food. We're allowed to travel. Now, this was a, an interesting one because I didn't take mine out for a while. You're allowed to exercise once a day for a while, and then they sort of relax that because there were people – that had obviously petitioned the government and said, we have reactive dogs. And for us to do um, a walk in the local area with everybody off is actually putting more pressure on that dog to behave in a certain way. So, or hyperreactive, because dog, if you're not reactive, you're dead. Um, <clears throat> so as far as I'm concerned, when, when they sort of said that you can drive a short distance, so that doesn't mean from London down to St. Right. or to Land's End or up into Scotland. It means, you know, a short distance. And the, the field, the farmer's field that I have permission to use is probably six mile away. It's on a well-travelled route. The police, it's on a border. So um, both Staffordshire and West Midland police police that area. And I keep an eye on that field for that farmer because there's a lot of um, people that tip rubbish out. And I just collect it, bring it home. That's my sort of payment to him. He's very good to me. Um, <clears throat> so, And whenever anybody's dumped anything, I can't move. I let him know. So I'm keeping an eye on his field for him. Um, so that, that helped with taking the dogs out is that I could, you know, get my troop, if you like, even if it's half of them, um, and take them for a run on what is their regular sort of relax play time, family time with mom, me, um, mom a dog. Um, and that helped. Now, there's people that are not following the rules and staying at home are over, uh, I think it's 70s, I'm not sure. But I think our over 70s have to stay in for 12 weeks because they've got a lowered immune response. Yeah. Um, and there are people as there are in every society that don't think the rules apply to them. I think we haven't had a no in our society for a while. Like the last was, you know, obviously um, wars that have gone on where you can't do this, communities pulled together. Um, so I think that, that it's relaxed sufficiently like... Um, my grandson lives a couple of blocks over and obviously doesn't come in or anything but they'll let me know he's coming so we can wave from the window so I still get to see them and they borrowed a dog before the shutdown went in or the lockdown as we call it here went in they borrowed one of my dogs who you know has um, adapted well and I knew he would because he was that type of personality and temperament <clears throat> and he's um so he's getting his walk, the, the tiny, as well as the... So from a health perspective, tiny, the, with the temporary little Pomeranian I rescued, <clears throat> has enabled... Is A, getting his preferred response, which is, oh, I'm the king of the castle type personality, 
to being there. So Alexander, who used who loves school running, you know, and could run all day, um, <clears throat> he's getting that sort of feedback. So in that, that situation's perfectly matched. But then you've got the dogs. I know I've got dogs here that me being at home all the time and very rarely going out and leaving them to have that rest. And when I move, they tend to move, not necessarily to do something. It's because I'm their trainer. I usually move towards them if we have foster dogs that I need to just manage that situation maybe a little bit. So my dogs are watching to see what I want from them. So I might say, bear, I've got it. You don't need to go in and do the dog. I can do this. Um, and I've found some of them are actually looking to come and rest as though I was going out to actually physically work because I don't go shopping. My husband does that. I'm very looking blessed. So he goes out and goes shopping on his way home from work because he's a key worker. So in that aspect, I'm sort of, I feel like the dogs. So I want to go out for a walk without them sometimes just to be away from them. And my dogs probably look forward to that hour, two hours that I'm, out walking or <clears throat> you know having a conversation across the fence when you both go out to empty your garbage in the garbage uh, trash can I'll, I'll do an Americanism there because I live for nine years in Canada so I understand <laughs> that language <laughs> not the bean <laughs> um, so I think with with the dogs they some dogs could be finding it stressful having all these humans in their space without that chill time of them sunbathing watching the squirrels, watching the birds. But then you've got the other flip side of the coin where there'll be those with separation distress or separation disorder, whichever you, whichever label you want to put on it, don't like to be on their own. They are probably really enjoying the affection from the humans and the humans are probably enjoying the lack of guilt, worry, because dog worry and dog joy when you come back is correlated in studies. I've just written that because that's part of my dissertation for my master's degree. So when you look at the um, aspect of the dog and the humans constantly cuddling the dog, fussing the dog, always the dog follows them to the bathroom, the dog follows them out. Whenever you've got that, it's really difficult to sort of, you know, or they go for a nap or they read a book or watch a movie. And the dog's there. They're getting that constant feed of affection, which is lovely, but it doesn't help them when it's not there in the future. And, you know, looking at uh, Karen overall work, Overall's work and Landsberg et al. work and the Marinus Price work, I might be saying the names wrong, but that's okay. Um, I know which books they are. <clears throat> and when you look at those and any sort of seminars or any training that I've gone on, uh, behaviourist training, often we need to desensitise them to the, they're not having all of those, like the keys, the perfume, the toothpaste, the coat, the shoes, the day of the week, the sounds that are outside, all of those the cues in the environment to say that they're leaving, they're not getting that. So that the dogs are getting that fix, that oxytocin fix, that soothing fix, that oh, chilling fix, but they're not being taught how to cope when that doesn't happen in the future. And that's where some of your routine for the human side of this, um, the, you still need to be, a, the dog still needs to be able to cope, even if it's for 10 seconds, 20 seconds, without you being there. And Yes, we're having puppies and puppies are still being transported. Even dogs are being adopted, but they're not getting the usual exposure for socialisation, which is all no novel experience. It's not just seeing other dogs and being able to cope with them and um, learn how, you know, another dog communicates back. It's, um, it's that the dog coping with that situation of that person leaving them either on their own or with another dog. There is one study, I can't remember the name, I can get it for you, Roman, so you can pop it on after. There's one study where they looked at another dog being in the home with the dog that, and how the, the dogs look to each other, another dog 
for support when the owner's not there, which I know I see all the time with mine, but I can't prove that. You know, if it's not in a science journal, um, it has to be proven. <clears throat> or, well, should I say suggested, statistic statistically significant. So I think it's it's key at this time to start putting in, if, if we're in, say, we've got another three weeks of lockdown and then they have a loosening of the... Um, the the guidance yeah that's the word sorry went blank then for a minute um if they have <laughs> i'd do that it's called a mom's moment <laughs> um if when if people can start putting in now three weeks three weeks at home doing mini sessions of leaving your dog even mini sessions and it may even be just to stay and they're able to move five steps away so it's not even out of sight at the moment because some of these dogs that I've worked with with separation anxiety, they, they're they just on the heel all the time. They can't cope with mom, dad, whoever, they're human, they're significant humans being out of sight. And they will even go to a person that's a stranger. If you look at the Ainsworth Strange Test, they'll even gravitate to that human because they're desperate for that human support because they can't cope with being on their own and this is where we could build in just like any training skills for the dog to be able to cope with because loving your pet letting them sleep in the bed popping them in a crate or not your choice how your dog all of that um you know um how, how can i say if you some dogs some people don't obedience train their dogs. The dogs just naturally learn what's acceptable and, and not. I, I, and that's what was some of the training my father taught me. He wouldn't necessarily do a training session. They just got rewarded for good behaviour. And then if he, they did something that was poor behaviour, they wouldn't get rewarded or then he'd ask for something that was good behaviour. Um you know, feeding the dog from the table. None of these have been correlated to link to um, separation anxiety. It is more about the dog feeling comfortable, relaxed, has things to do when the human isn't there. And that's either activities that may be, and depending on the dog, this is where I say you really need to, it's not a blanket rule for every single dog. You know, I may see 10 separation anxiety cases from mild to fairly severe. Some of my need to refer to my, uh, their vet. And I, I spit all that they may be from my vet referred to me, which is great because I've already got that first step out of the way. And they may need to go back to the vet. You know, you can give them some nutritional supplements. You can give them um, if you support batch remedies if you support essential oils like Carol Ingraham does um, a fantastic rescue remedy. The rescue remedy is more for an emergency state and calming, I find. It's, it doesn't go to the, if you look at Dr. Batch's work, it doesn't go to the, or what he suggests is, there's always the soul state underneath the rescue remedy that's out of balance. And there's a specific remedy, maybe oak, it may be, and they're very similar, but Oak is, if you like, I always call Elm the teachers. It's that end of year. You need a bit of Elm to get you through because one more thing, being asked by your manager, <laughs> you'll, <laughs> you'll be in the toilet crying or the bathroom crying. Whereas Oak is more about, you know, uh, recovery. I see Oak as a recovery um, remedy um, that I used to use when things used to be getting, and I was still coping, but it was more to just keep me going more so than the that tipping point at the end. Um, <clears throat> and then there's your oils. And depend. I, I'm a firm believer in the dogs choose their oils. Like I'll, I'll get orange oil out, say, for example. Yeah. As I said, I've got 20 dogs. I've got three fosters in at the moment because we tried to empty the kennels um, <clears throat> that I, I support. And I'll present the bottle. I won't drip it anywhere. I present the bottle to them. And you'll have perhaps seven come up and maybe lick it. And these are only ever used for the dogs. They're not used for the humans. I've got a human case and a dog case. So you're, you're lick it. in that case, you're suggesting you're doing zoopharmacology, like, like the dog Exactly. Choose they choose self-medicate. Yeah. Um, and then if they sort of stay around a little bit more, I think, okay, well, do they want a bit more? And then you ask the question. And for people that have not seen that, it's a very natural way where the 
dog tries to get you to, you know, if it's the inguinal oil that they need there, they'll do that. And obviously I would always suggest people go for training for that. I'm a degree qualified aromatherapist. My vets know that they refer me to, but I always bounce it back to the vets when I'm going to use an oil with a dog because I don't know. I'm not that knowledgeable on medications. That's what the vet's there for. So there's definitely um, tiers of responsibilities and job descriptions in there, what I feel comfortable doing and what I also am ethically and um, um, under my insurance able to do. And I need that vet to say yes. And I usually then, um, they, they use... The, the vets that I work with have a knowledge of the aromatherapy, also, although they're not aromatherapy quite. Gotcha. Uh, uh, do you know what I mean? So it's more of a communication for the best effect for the dog. Um, so there's that. There's um, lack of structure and discipline. Um, as a person, um, I like structure. I had <laughs> quite a few children. Um, I had three children on my own. Then I got, I, we had a blended family, so I've got six children. Um, and so there had to be some structure and I think with trying to fit everything in in my life and being a lecturer for most of it and also being in an appointment based system I, I like my structure my dogs respond well to my structure but they also respond to a, a, a relaxation of that structure because it's predictable that mom still there they still get fed at the same similar time they still get walked at a similar time they've still got play which they're doing now which is about normal because it's cooler here. It's been about 21 degrees here, which is nice for them. So, um, but if you're more of a laissez-faire type of person and you've got no structure or you have got little structure and you work shift works, dogs are, can be adaptable. They adapt very well, which is why as a species, they're so prevalent as our companion animals. Um, it's just that some dogs, if they're coming in and, they don't know what to expect for the first few weeks. That's when a routine, I think, benefits them knowing what's coming in. What's um, This is when we get fed. You know, if you've got a resource guard or over food, this is when we get fed. This is when we get the treats. This is when we get the cones. This is when we get our supper. This is when we get the extra, you know, dentist stick. If we use dentist sticks, I don't. Um, but some of my customers do. So this, and I say sometimes when you set up a routine, it's some. It's more for the um, the relationship building. So the dog and the human know what to expect in that situation. And with separation anxiety disorder, separation distress disorder, whatever you want to call it, um, training has been found to have a major impact on um, the dogs and being able to alleviate it. But there's core foundation behaviors or for core um, foundation training methodology that's needed to enable the dog to cope with being left on their own and some of that stay behavior some of that's relaxation to map behavior um, that came down from Karen overall I think it did way back when um, you know, stay in sight, stay just slightly out of sight. So you're behind sort of a fence, but they can still see you as they build it up. Distance, time, distraction, all of that goes in so that you're giving the dog skills to cope with. And then I did um, five days with Shirag Patel and he's a fantastic trainer, totally different personality to some of the trainers I've um, gone and done some seminars with. And it was one of the, methods he taught was and i found this fascinating was the dog has control over the owner coming back and it was fascinating to watch it this little um terrier type this lady couldn't go out he was trashing the crate so we got rid of the cat he suggested getting rid of the crate and they were glad because they didn't like it so that there's the buy into that i suppose they um frosted the windows so that that you know the dog could um could cover the wind, um, couldn't see what was going by because they were on a, um, I don't, do you know what a terraced house is? Yes. Well, it was on a corner terrace. So it not only had it got the front big bay windows that are the Victorian terraces over here, it had also got all the windows down the side, which meant if you look at the dog, the dog was not only guarding the front as well as having access to upside, 
it was also being stressed by the people going past because it was like the main road from another main road so it was like a lesser main road onto this housing estate so he was probably so <laughs> stressed. frustrated yeah yeah and like, yeah all of that whether he was frustrated or just worried or you know so and what shirag showed us and i hope he doesn't mind me sharing this but i thought he was brilliant so i'm sure he's okay with that what shirag showed us in, and it was two, two two and a half hours he was in the um the barn was how the dog he would first of all he'd load up the bed um you know that that was the dog's bed we were all sitting we were all told to be quiet which we would we was fascinated and then the owner would walk away and if the dog looked up the owner would stop and then if the dog went to move off the bed the dog would come the the owner would come back which is I was watching this thinking, well, this isn't what I've actually been <laughs> taught any time beforehand. So it just shows you, and it was a, it's a good approach. And this is the thing where I say, it's not a recipe book for a dog. I've got seven Samoyeds, and every one of them is, is, is different. And if I approached every one of them um, the same, I, I wouldn't get... Um, the response from, say, Sasha's very playful and likes to run really fast. So if I got her to do really static movements all the time, she'd find that utterly frustrating. Now, Marco's slower, likes to think about things, still does it on the first ask, but he just hasn't got that speed of movement. And this is where this, I was just, I just sat there and I thought, wow. And I don't often think, wow. Okay, Lawrence is another one I really like, Steve Mann as well. And I thought, I often think, well, I, I thought, wow, that is a really different way of approaching that the dog has the choice and the control over where the mum comes back. Now, this was on the Monday. On the Friday, we went for a visit to see this dog and she sent in video footage as well. And the dog had already started in that four days. So from Monday to Friday, that dog had already started to show massive improvements on just that application and giving that and they'd, they'd been able to go out for I think it was half an hour without any destruction now that's massive she couldn't leave the dog for two three minutes so to me that was a really different approach I know we go on choices and force free and positive reinforcement and you know allowing the dog sometimes to communicate with you if you've got a really good bond with a dog communicate with you as what is their way because as i said they're all individuals i think you can have breed specifics you can have lasses that do this you can have sammies that do this you can have german shepherds that do but they're all they've all had different learning experiences even if they're in the same household every single one of mine has a different learning experience i totally i so, totally agree with you with that also one mm -hmm. thing that I, that I see and i also teach in my classes is that we have to understand trauma at the core we, we always observe yes. dogs as a behavior, and then we don't see the roots of the behavior. So we That's see a right. dog panicking, and then we say, well, the, pan the dog has anxiety, so we have to suppress the anxiety by just applying classical conditioning. But we don't understand why the dog offers that thing. And as the, you have set a good example, one thing that I offer always is try to understand that the dog in his trauma, he had no control of the situation. So exactly. the fear of not being in control of his environment, his survival instinct kicks in. So he's in survival mode because he's not in control. Exactly. Leaving the dog in the crate, he's not in control of access to water. Many people put the dogs in the crate without water. Now, people mm -hmm. love the dogs and hug the dogs all the time. Dog is not in control when that happens because we call the dog over, we pat him, and then we send him away. So once we help the dog understand that he can be in control, that he does need to worry because we respect what he needs met. And so from that survival relationship, we switch over into secure attachment relationship. That dog totally That's shifts it. because now yeah. he trusts that he's being taken care of. He does need to worry about what's going to happen tomorrow and next. And we have mm -hmm. also to see that some traumas are accumulated. For example, the pet sitter or the, the, the owner leaves. The dog expects the owner to come back and suddenly the pet sitter comes back. Well, that's a shock. Then the pet sitter, because he doesn't keep the routines as the owner, change the routines. The dog goes into survival mode because the routines are not met. 
The pet sitter is in the rush to leave, puts the dog quickly in the crate, doesn't follow the protocol, doesn't follow the ritual. The dog goes even further into trauma, then closes the crate. The third, fourth day, the owner doesn't come back. The dog shuts down. Mm -hmm. And then the owner comes back and now we have already a trauma. Now the dog doesn't want to go back in the crate and nobody knows why, because the dog loves the crate, right? We don't see that connection. And all of a sudden the dog, because of that, that generalizes because dogs have our emotional intelligence, like just like a five-year-old. Absolutely. <laughs> find the, they don't understand what we do when we're gone. So now the dog starts creating these drama thoughts. What's going to happen? She's going to be gone again forever. It's kind of like mm-hmm. a word, an action, a gesture can trigger a whole trauma event for the dog not being able to predict the future would causes you know separation anxiety actually mm-hmm. separation anxiety i would say there are two categories the one is fear of death the mm-hmm. dog afraid and survival mode and the other one is fear of failure on the job description because picture uh... if we if we have the dog always on our side like mastiffs guardian breeds and we condition the dog next to me is always what i want you to do and then i leave yes he will not be able yeah. to follow that job. Now that mm-hmm. separation anxiety comes from lack of ability to perform to the job, which caused the dog to go into panic mode because if he doesn't comply to the job, he's being abandoned because that's his in DNA. If I don't comply, mm-hmm. I'm being abandoned, abandoned by the only mm-hmm. one who I have left. So yes. these are two different ways to approach those separation anxieties because the other one, you have to teach the dog to stay away from you. And the other one dog is to feel comfortable with you. Yes, yes. But that's secu- that's avoidant and anxious human pet attachment. I think it was Zilch um, Mil- Milano um, in 2011 did a pet attachment scale. I think there's also a Monash if people are interested in doing it because the questionnaires online they can access that. Um, and I my dissertation at the moment that I, I'm working through is is the human attachment bond, which they're only giving me avoidant and anxious those are the ones that were i know but to me i answered it when when i did a, a bigger one that was outside of this ages ago i'm secure on all my attachments which is great considering i thought i was a bit neurotic but it's good on paper that i'm, I'm secure it's there i'm secure um and is the anxious so i got um the participants to fill out the c bot which is also a good behavioral profile profile for owners to do just out of interest to see if there's any, um, you know, uh, flashing up of certain behaviors so they can help to um, put in some behavioral modification plans to support that. But I'm looking at this, is the CBAR that says that the dog has separation anxiety issues that the owner's completed linked to the pet attachment style of the owner that is anxious or avoidant because I can't see any secure because I've got quite a few that have answered on the human side of it that they are avoidant or anxious but not secure. So that's another, it's quite going to be quite. And then I've got video footage of how they are greeting because if you look at any separation anxiety studies, I've only found eight, seven papers and mentions in two as part of the separate. that are on greeting behaviours in dogs. Can you believe that? We, that's what we live for is coming home to our fluffies right, right. or non-fluffies if you've got a Chinese crested. And that is our behavior when we come in, creating that behavior when you go out so that they seek that affection more and it's causing more of an intense. Now, there was one study that says if you are affectionate before your dog leaves, before you leave your dog, that, it, that oxytocin has a longer lasting effect. So the science is saying the fuss in your dog's okay, but a lot of the interventions that people have in books and um, booklets or whatever, or guidance are saying, don't touch your dog for 30 minutes. So I don't know whether I can do that. I just get ready and leave my dogs. I don't necessarily go and fuss every single one of them. They just know the routine. Okay, we, we're doing this. Mom's go, and, I, and Alexa goes on. <laughs> to whatever to their soft reggae which is what they like and that that is their cue to say mom's going out i think and one aspect that we forget here is that we have to understand that dogs have rituals yes and they have family code of conduct but i i, I understand where, where the science comes in from an angle that 
animals are pack animals and have this linear hierarchy system and they follow the boss and whatever the boss tells them to do. Now we know already mm -hmm. that's an old story. Now that, we yeah, know yeah. that we have a nonlinear system and dogs do connect and it's a matriarchic system basically where the mm -hmm. dogs have this attachment relationship with the mother but seek education from other parts of the family members and dogs do yeah. group in families and even um, with, with scientists who, who research dogs who are free roaming like the um, dogs in India, the, yes. the treaties, we see that um, they form families and actually what they also do that I recognize later that they, they have different types of friendships. They have friendships yes, they to go hunting, they have friendships to go and scavenging, they have friendships to be safe and secure attachment relationships, and then they yeah. have friendships who are to go fight wars with others. That blow me off. Yeah. So they yeah. can create um, relationships to t be taken advantage of to do something they're not benefiting from. It didn't make any sense. Yeah. Now, when we go back yeah. into the home and we see the dogs are opportunistic scavengers, that search yes. for secure attachment relationship. And then mm -hmm. we're not creating those rituals. And suddenly we say, oh, now we'll change. That causes anxiety. Because Absolutely. And that's quiet. what I said at the beginning. I said, I like my rituals. I work well on a routine. I can be surprised. I can be spontaneous <laughs> or spontaneous. Um, I can be all of those things. But I find I'm more productive if I have that routine set. So, you know, I'm up at half past four, five o'clock. The dogs are fed by six. We're out on the fields for half past six. Well, not on half past, but we're sort of getting ready to go to the field because they've had their hour lie down. If it's really hot, that hot weather we had last summer, I, it was even later because I'd take them on the field because it was cooler first thing. So they adapted to having their, their breakfast, if you like, two hours after that so they do adapt but that was a routine for while it was hot so the cue to them was it's hot mom's going to do this but mom's the consistent and this is the thing i'm the consistent person in that they i've got a lot of eye contact in my dogs and when they are looking for guidance they give they do a check-in or they do an icon you know and i'll just go go on then it's okay on you go or walk on or whatever you do or me just doing this and if you watch any of my videos on my Facebook account or it, anything, it's quite um, organic rather than being, I've always said I, I, I'm not an obedience trainer. That does not float my boat. I want dogs to be ha sort of happy as much as you can use the word happy and anthropomorphize the behavior. I want them to be secure, contented, pleasant to other dogs, or they just come away, they give me the look and I say over this way. That's what I want for my dogs. And I get that because I feel my routine and my structure supports them in that. Now, if we say, okay, Sunday, lockdown's up, we're going to the beach, we pop them all in the, the van an hour after, and we go to the beach with them, which is about two hours away, you know, and the, the older ones stay here a little bit more because they're, it's too much for them because I've got a 14-year-old Rottweiler um, and a 10-year-old Shepherd. So if, say, some of the older ones want to stay here or the ones that I think won't enjoy it, which is very rare, I know, but some of them don't like water. So, And we're playing and I want to work with certain a group of dogs. They can adapt to that because the secure person in their lives, as well as my husband, but me more so than him, is is there with them if he took them to the beach on his own there'd be probably calls to say i found your lost dog <laughs> because they would be looking for me because i'm the main person in their life so i, I agree with um the trauma and I, I agree um they've found with blind dogs that that dogs can get that attachment but the attachment with um the uh, support dogs for the blind or visually impaired is usually in a structured manner. But when you're taking, say, street dogs from Cyprus, when you're, or Rome, um, Greece or Spain or wherever, or Brazil for over with you or Mexico, and you're taking those dogs and then putting them in a home, that in itself becomes stressful if they're linked, they're strong person, because you're changing the whole world and it's their environmental shift. You have to look at the environment every time. I had this one lady that used to come to class as an example, and she used to, 
I, I can get him to do everything here. I'd say, okay, that's great. I can't get him to do it at home. Okay. I say, well, do you train in the same place every day? Well, no, I do it a bit in the garden. I say, well, try picking the same place for now. So the dog then started to do it, say, in front of the fireplace in the living room, in the main family room. She got the behaviours. I said, now, just move it four foot. And she had to start, not right at the beginning, but back again, because the picture that the dog has of mom training is different to the picture by the, the you know, mom training at the, the class and mom training him at the by the fireplace was very different. And I think we don't realise how some little changes can impact on some dogs quite significantly. And, yes, they do generalise, but... I found in the main they generalise with poor behaviour to situations or, or bad, poor situations, stressful situations, more so than the positive situations. We still need to proof behaviours in those positive situations so the dog understands and communicates, I'm, I'm okay to do a sit here, I'm okay to do a sit there or I'm okay to come to you if I'm unsure. Yeah, that's fine. We'll just go this way because you've just shown me that you don't want to go that way. We'll go this way. That's okay. Right. So I think with separation and, and this um, issue of being stuck at home with your dog, it's a perfect opportunity to start desensitizing. So getting the dog used to the rattling, the keys, and there's nothing there. There's nothing go Nothing to see here is what I call the training plan that I give to my customers. Um, nothing to see here and they do that and then there's the relaxation to mats so the mat becomes part of the dog relaxes anyway so you're building up all those associations so eventually it may not be that some dogs you can never leave for more than two to three hours you've got to get somebody in which I wouldn't want to leave anybody and from my study most people leave their dogs between three to five hours it's very rare that people leave their dogs over that um, so if you're self, so one of the questions I'm self employed at the moment, and there's a couple of my customers that are so that what they've tried to do is, if you like, write down a school routine for the dogs, um, which I think is really useful. Um, so you know, you have a certain time. So if you're self employed, there'll be certain, I'm assuming, certain hours that you would be working. And again, there's that flexibility in there if you created a, a structure that the dog can cope with. And it's all about the dog. So it's no good saying to my dogs, OK, I'm going to get you up at 11 to go out. They just go out. And I've done it when we've, can't, we, when we've been out. And I thought, oh, I'll let the dogs out at 11. And we've, say, gone out for, I don't know, to see my mum and dad or something. We come back, say, at half past 10, 11, I let my dogs out and they just stand there looking at me because they're usually in bed for eight. So I don't need to let my dogs out after eight because they're going to be up at half past four. And even when I let my dogs out at 11, they're still up at half past four. So there's no point. So you're saying um, um, you keep, keep that routine, keep that routine routines, yeah, the routines, routines of the afternoon routine. routine. So even if you, yes. are, if you are in a position where you have your dogs, your dogs. Um, so I have a, I have a, I have a back, back flash response. Okay. So even if you have, uh, let me see if I can change that. Better now? Okay. I, I got a feedback from you. Um, so when, when we do a repetition uh, uh, overview, so when, when you have your dogs in the daily routine and even you have self-employed and you have these regular daily routines, keep those routines as if you would regularly work. Make sure you're taking your dogs out for this time that he needs to go. Keep your food feeding routine. Keep your walking routine. Keep your attachment routines. What time you have time for your dogs? Now, if if you pass that level, because most of us are not self-employed, we work suddenly at home for a couple of weeks. We want to make sure that we're going back to those routines. Because I feel, from my experience, that dogs will take one or two weeks to kind of adjust back to the normal things. So don't end up knowing that next week you're going to go for work again, all of a sudden now you stop the routine and change it, you're going to create panic to your dog because of those attachment relationships and routines that you already set. And some dogs do easily with changes. Some dogs do not. Some dogs come from um, trauma or, or um, most dogs are being surrendered and so have carrying with them certain traumas and suddenly they can be triggered. 
because suddenly you leave and you don't come back for six hours and that can can create a PTSD response. So we want to make sure that these routines are set. Then in between, don't always expect your dogs to figure things out. Do training sessions, um, educate them. So you can use those times that you guys are together efficiently working with your dogs and setting new routines. Teach him to sit, teach him that you can walk away, teach him that you can walk away and disappear for a certain period of time. It could be a distance, could be a time related thing. You can see through your webcam what your dog is doing and help your dog understand that he can be in control of what's happening in his surroundings. Let him know that offering you the body language, you will be supporting that and confirming his concerns. There's no bad thing to tell the dog, I understand that you're worried about that, but give me another minute. I'll, I'll come back in a second. Let me walk away and come back again. See, the waiting has been rewarded because I went outside to get you some food. Now, there is a reason for you waiting. And so you give a reasoning to the dog. And if the dog has a reasoning and the dog can be in control of that reason, that you will go back and he can and he can wait for you because of that reason. And so the dog doesn't need to feel that you're ignoring his messages. So he's worried about that you didn't see what happened. And so he starts having separation anxiety before you even leave. And some of the dogs become even aggressive, attacking your legs and your feet and your hands before you leave, especially if you touch the shoes, the back, the keys. We also have to be very comfortable of recognizing when we trigger the dog, when we suddenly go to the bathroom and then we go to the kitchen and then we go grab our bag. Well, that routine is already set. Oh, she knows you're going to leave, right? Um, <laughs> and so we have to make sure so that we have to all make these sure things, are things are covered. Yeah. And so, and so a short overview, a short overview you guys have as a, have as a, that, um, Catherine is here today to, to work with us and explain it. So if you go back all the way to the beginning and listen to the whole conversation that we had today, you will see that so many details are important for your dog not to have that separation anxiety because you were able to predict what's going to happen because you watched that video and you can share that video with others. So you recognize how all these things are escalating to the point that a dog will have separation anxiety if you don't follow all these little rules. It's just like with children, nothing much different because dogs are emotional intelligence and they do have attachment relationships and they do have trauma and they do need to be in control of situations. And of course, sometimes they're over exaggerating and the kind of drama queens, kings of the hills on your bed. But on the other hand, they're still vulnerable souls that we have to respect their needs. And sometimes we also cause them trauma because we don't know their needs. We don't respect their needs and we just do whatever we think is right. So closing, so is, there closing anything, is there anything you, you want to tell, want to uh, tell our, uh, listeners uh, our listeners today? I just think um, if you have a situation where you do need help, get help. Because with um, separation anxiety for example some people start using a different door to go out um and that can cause the dog to even be more anxious because not only have they got to watch this door they've now got to watch this door um so seek help there's there's really good uh, books written you know karen overhaul it's an expensive book and it's for more clinical work um, talk to your vets because they usually refer people that have specialisms in their area or veterinary behaviorist. Um, and uh, just, you know, ask yourself. Um, you can try some um, nutraceuticals, which are your, your Serenum we have here, your CBD or we didn't get onto, but that could be another thing to, you know, what's for calming generally. Um, just don't... Um, how can I say? Some people will try something and it actually makes the situation worse. And it's best to talk to somebody. Carry on with what you're doing now. It's not going to make it worse if you're sticking to what you're doing now. But in if you need support to get the dog and your relationship to be working more effectively and more understanding about body language and what the dog's saying to you, then that's when I would seek help. And I've sought help for myself because as much as I've worked with dogs and I've got a whole laboratory that I'm watching out here playing and I see different how they respond to different behaviours and different um, dogs that come in and, you know, the dogs that can't cope with being on their own when I pop them in the kitchen to feed the dogs that aren't mine because I like mine to have sort of a relaxed 
feeding session that they're not they're not having dogs that are street dogs trying to get to every scrap of food on the floor um you know seek help seek support because it's about making your relationship better because that's the key to be fair when i'm talking to my customers it's their relationship and i'm one of these that a dog comes into your life to teach you something about yourself and i've had a lot of dogs <laughs> that are my greatest teachers because at the end of the day they are fantastic teachers for making you observe things which has made me a better human with other humans as well a good, so, question, a good question that i saw that here, I saw here um, asked, how about the feeling of prong collars and e-collars um in 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 our lives of separation anxiety we don't use uh, people i don't think they will go to use um prong collars but i see people who use um shock collars and bark collars to control that uh, stay away from it there is no scientific evidence no whatsoever that would improve that usually it makes it worse so the dog not only he's not in control he's being punished for feeling separation anxiety he's being punished of being in panic he's being punished of being in 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 a panic situation and survival response the dog cannot get away from it his fear to get out makes him bark more to the and some cheap collars and pro, uh, bark collars actually don't have self-regulating system so would continue punishing the dog for every noise they make i know um collars who go off if the dog shakes his head so he's being punished for barking then shakes his head and trigger the trigger again or a neighbor's dog will bark and that is being triggered uh, i've i've seen it all so stay away from punishing methods because separation anxiety is a fear response and fear response has to be treated as fear response and there is no aggression behind that and even if the dog wants to break out of his crate building a stronger crate and bigger steel and concrete walls doesn't fix the dog's problem so you have to seek help so we are here to help you Catherine can help you i can help you we work online with people as well for years so if you have a problem first of all seek help Ask a professional. We can recommend you what to do if it's important to go to a veterinarian and seek help, medical help. If it's just a simple thing that we can address in specific in 45 minutes max, uh, find the root of the problem, help you walk through the process. It's not the easy fix. It's not just you push a button and things changes. It has to have a routine and has to have a ritual. And so I feel we need to see dogs just like personal beings with emotional intelligence with individual experiences with even if they are specific breeds they still are individuals even if they behave like their breeds they're still individuals that have individual needs mm -hmm. i agree i agree and as i've said i've got 20 dogs of my own three foster dogs in at the moment and i couldn't apply the same i can apply the theory of learning and training but which may in five dogs work that way but if i was doing lure uh, training with say bella all the time which is my one of my rottweilers she prefers shaping because she loves problem solving so that floats her boat i'm meeting her needs as a trainer because not only is there's you know there's the trainers that do a little bit of behavior then there's the behaviorists that don't do training i think as a behaviorist you need to understand training theory but as trainers, you need to understand the behavior. So it's like a merge there. And it's a very gray area in there. I do both. I'll be qualified. I am qualified in both. Um, and I'll be higher education qualified in both, hopefully by September when all of this finishes. Yay. <laughs> um, my master's degree, yes. Finish my I'll be able to feed back to you as well on that. That'd be interesting for you. Um, yeah, we need to talk about that because I've done a lot of work. I haven't done scientific haven't evidence done scientific research, evidence but, I have a lot, but I have a lot um, um, collected information. Collected information. So far, yeah. I work so far with 2,000 online clients, so online clients, online clients. Data. Data. Mm -hmm. and, and responses and to different things. things. So we definitely have to share information. Have to share information. Yeah. I so appreciate I you for being here today. Here today. No thank problem. you so much for sharing. I know some people got tired because we were talking a lot, but all the conversation is important because you have to get the big picture. Makes sense? Makes sense. So thank you. And it's a massive issue. In, in the UK alone, uh, let me think, I think there's 14,000 dogs, 14 million dogs, yeah, and there's 1.7 million dogs suffering from separation anxiety at a given time, and that, that's from really bad to really mild. 
Right. So it's worth right. bearing in mind, both, and if people are listening in that are trainers, that it's an area to be aware of because it's, it's significant in the for dogs. You know, they they it's a income all on its own, regardless of classes and all the rest of it. So um, it's something that I find fascinating because never no two cases are the same. So I'm thank you very a, much I'm for inviting me. I'm preparing a class I'm for, a class for, for habit training and foster and education. And foster education. So I would love so to, would to, love dedicate, to the chapter, dedicate the chapter that, 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 that you can that you put your information, put your information in, in from your perspective. From your perspective. Okay, so no I'm, problem. I'm, I'm happy to do that. Happy to do when do you need that boy? <laughs> 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 yeah, I know you are. You are Please don't say in the next two weeks. No, 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 no. <laughs> I but, uh, but I'll share with you I'll my slides. You I, my think slides. I, have, I think I have at least one chapter least one is 130, chapter slides 130 slides for five individual five days. Individual days of this process. Yeah. process. Yeah. I think yeah. people have people have lack of education. They just they just um, look on internet look on not reliable sources to get their information try apply with failures and trials and the dog suffers from it so we have to give accurate information out there so again i so appreciate you for being here today, today and i think we got a we got feedback from people feedback from people thank um, you um, looking forward to have you again on the show right no problem <laughs> now i've done it once first time's <laughs> always a blast <laughs> thank you roman thank everybody thank you thank you bye-bye <laughs>